Hello everyone, how are you today? My name is Rafael Loyola. I'm a professor at the Federal University of Goiás in Brazil. And now I'm also the science director of the Brazilian Foundation for Sustainable Development. And actually I'd like to start this uh, small talk on systematic conservation planning by telling you about this, this big move that I made in my career uh, last year. So I've been a professor in the Department of Ecology at the Federal University of Goiás for the last 10 years. And the, this university is located in a region in Brazil that we call the Cerrado, the Brazilian Cerrado. That's the richest tropical savanna in the world. It, it still has nearly 50% of its native vegetation remaining, uh, but it's a biome that is severely impacted by agriculture expansion, especially by agribusiness. And it has today something like 8.6% of its area covered by protected areas. And in this place today, conservation is priority. That's what we need to do in order to keep this native vegetation that still remains in the Cerrado. But in the beginning of the last year, I, have, I had this opportunity to, to took as the science director of an NGO in Brazil. And this NGO is in Rio de Janeiro. And Rio de Janeiro is a completely different place from Goiânia, the city where I was. And it is located in the Atlantic rainforest. This, this is a very different biome in Brazil. It is home to 125 million people. Uh, and it has, on the best case scenario, 28% of its native vegetation uh, still remaining. It is a biome with different challenges. It is severely impacted by climate change, not by agriculture. And it has nearly 10% of its uh, area covered by protected area. In, in this biome, restoration is priority, not necessarily conservation uh, per se. And why am I telling you this? Because this has everything to do with systematic conservation planning, knowing the difference between uh, regions, knowing what impacts different regions, what kind of threats these regions receive and understanding the, the key priorities to act and safeguard biodiversity in these regions is the core of conservation planning. So this leads us to some key questions that people working or the community working with systematic conservation planning usually ask. First one is, is biodiversity well protected in the regions? This is a very a kind of simple question, but sometimes difficult to answer. Uh, but it's the, the, the primary one. I mean, we need to know what do we have in terms of biodiversity in a particular region, and then we need to understand if this biodiversity is well protected. Uh, and if it's not, which is most often the case, then we need to seek areas in which you can uh, try to protect those species. So where should protected areas be placed? And protected areas is just establishment of protected areas, just one strategy that we can apply in systematic conservation planning. Actually, we're planning for actions. We're planning for different types of actions, including the establishment of protected areas that we can uh, develop in order to safeguard biodiversity. Uh, another question is, what are the key sites to manage? If I'm thinking about restoration, uh, the removal of invasive species, uh, fire control, where should I act? This is a very important question. Uh, then we have all the challenges imposed by uh, climate change. So how to factor climate change in the equation and how can we uh, design uh, a network of places or sites to act when species distribution are always changing, especially because of climate change and also because of land use change. And then, of course, how can we make it happen? How can we actually implement such a plan and how can we influence policy 
in, in a way that we're not just doing academic exercise, but we're trying to produce some solutions that could be used for, for conservation. And this is core questions in systematic conservation planning. Systematic conservation planning is a science in, develop, in development since the 80s. And it has passed through uh, a very large methodological discussion, especially in the 90s, where we are discussing different algorithms and different ways to find solutions to protect biodiversity and how to be uh, more effective in doing so. Then we, we saw a seminal paper arising in 2000. It was a paper published by Margus, uh, Chris Margus and Bob Pressey in Nature. It has changed the field because now we have some kind of systematization or a protocol to follow in order to achieve what we have been called in systematic conservation plan. And we had several applications since then. It goes from a different use and, and several uh, scientific papers discussing the importance in applying to different regions with different groups, different methods, to uh, uses in different governments, especially in Australia, South Africa, uh, some places in Europe, United States, and in Brazil. And government in Brazil and those other countries are also using systematic conservation planning to define their strategies and priorities for biodiversity conservation. So we, we have a lot of history, 40 years of history of this science, and most that has been done uh, has been done in an academic uh, uh, ecosystem, but also, uh, especially after the 2000, 2000 six, maybe 2007, we have seen different governments using this tool to support their conservation decision. And this, this systematic, systematic conservation planning, it has some core principles that we can call CARE principles, and it's because uh, the, the acronym that we can uh, create with different uh, concepts. The first one is that systematic conservation planning should be comprehensive. It means that we need a little bit of everything. In the jargon of conservation planning, everything that we want to protect, we call a goal. And you need to establish different goals in order to represent biodiversity and, and have it and has it protected. So the idea is if you're really doing an on-the-ground conservation planning to help, for example, the government to establish uh, a plan, then you need to have a, the most wide uh, sample of biodiversity that you need. You do, you do not want just to protect mammals, for example. You need to protect mammals and all the vertebrates, but also invertebrates, uh, plants, uh, and also different other kinds of biodiversity uh, metrics like uh, types of ecosystems, uh, different ecoregions, representation of different uh, vegetation types, um, the representation of different ecosystem services that, that different places provide, and sometimes you can go further and trying to represent phylogenetic diversity or functional diversity. <clears throat> so this means and to be comprehensive, you need to get a little bit of everything if that's your objective. Uh, the second concept is conservation planning needs to be adequate. And this is a jargon, it means that you need to have persistence. You need to guarantee that the plan you're doing will work for a long time. And this is especially important because resources are so scarce, then you, you cannot afford doing a plan that will work for one year. So you need to think at over large time scales, maybe 30 years, and try to guarantee uh, how you're going to do that. This is, this is the most difficult uh, concept in conservation planning. Ideally, you will get some measure of, of persistence by modeling or estimating the persistence of populations from different species. But this is uh, rarely the case and we try to achieve persistence by defining targets, like saying that 
we need to represent 10% or 15% of the distribution of the species and we assume or some people will say we believe that in doing so we will achieve uh, that persistence. The other concept is that conservation planning needs to be representative. It means that biodiversity surrogates should work because of course you will never be able to to get all data necessary to represent biodiversity. So sometimes you need to use you need to use surrogates. You, you use some part of biodiversity that is capable of representing uh, more or less uh, another uh, large part. Sometimes it will be very straightforward, like using mammals to represent uh, many other species that are associated with mammals, using endemic species uh, to represent other endemic species because we know that endemism is some kind of nested within the geographic space. And sometimes you have very broad surrogates like using a vegetation type or ecoregion to represent all the biodiversity that is within it. This is not necessarily good, but sometimes it's just what you have at your hand and that's what you're gonna use. So you, what you need to do is try to use surrogates that are representative of the type of biodiversity that we're looking for. And last, but not least, conservation planning should be effective. It, 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 it has to be an intelligent way to spend the small resources that we have uh, available for conservation. Those resources could be a monetary resource, we're talking about money, but we can also talk, talk about uh, uh, places to act, political will, uh, human resources available to do something and, and time available to do that. So what conservation plan is trying to do is to in, in some way optimize the use of those resources and get the highest biodiversity representation or conservation that can be achieved with these resources. That's what we call being effective, an intelligent way to spend the resources. So the care principles are uh, comprehensive, adequate, representative, and effective. If you build up a conservation plan and it has those attributes, then it is supposedly a good one. And then a typical systematic conservation workflow will look like uh, the graphic and the figure you see in, in the screen. Uh, so first, uh, at up the green box, you gather data and you build models for biodiversity. So you need to assemble all the data that you need. If you're working with species distribution, then you need species uh, data. It could be uh, locality records, point records. It could be species range maps. Uh, or it could be uh, you, you use some of those data to build a model, to build an ecological niche model, and then project that model into space and get a species distribution model that you use for conservation. But again, this data could be uh, <clears throat> other things than, than species distribution. It could be ecosystem types or vegetation types or um, ecosystem services, then you need a model of the ecosystem services uh, delivery in the area, anything. So you need to gather all this data, you need to build the models that relate the data to uh, the geographic space in which we, you, you were trying to work. Then after that, you have spatial data of all your the attributes, the features, or the goals that you want to represent in that uh, conservation planning and it will check for current biodiversity representation in protected areas. This is an important uh, step, we call this a gap analysis and we're trying to see how much of that biodiversity that we have assembled is currently or already protected. So uh, theoretically we don't need to worry about uh, that because we know that a particular amount of biodiversity is already protected and we just want to protect the other amount that we need to protect and it is not uh, formally protected today. So for this you have some kind of information like how much 
uh, how many species are inside protected areas, uh, what is the average um, size of species distribution that is protected within uh, the area, and so forth. Then, when you know what is protected and how much do you still need to protect, you will uh, define or evaluate representation targets. This is a way to achieve adequacy, or to guarantee that the, the planning will, will be good and it will last for, for many years because you're guaranteeing that populations or ecosystem services or whatever you are trying to protect will uh, last over the years. Then you try to uh, evaluate what will be the idea representation, like do I need 50% of the distribution of species, do I need uh, a particular number of individuals to protect, do I need a particular area that will provide some kind of ecosystem services uh, that need to be protected, this is the time to do that. Then, when you have all this, all the data, all the models, you, you know what is protected or not, and you know how much you should protect uh, based on your idea of the, the best planning, then you run the analysis and using some optimization algorithm. And there are several variables, and, and they are implemented in different softwares. So you can use a, a very a popular software called MarkSan, uh, which was developed by um, my friends in Australia. And MarkSan, what we'll do is to provide a set of priority areas that will achieve the targets you have established. You can use another software like Zonation, uh, also developed for, by colleagues from, from Finland, and it will give basically the same uh, result. What are the places that you, you, you must uh, invest your time, energy, money, people to protect biodiversity? So the, the, the particular output of this is a map of priority areas and maybe some tables of graphics that can tell you uh, how good the planet is or how much of the biodiversity are you capturing with this planet. Then you will review all this information, review the representation uh, that you have achieved with your pin and make adjustments because sometimes there is a particular species that is very important but is very poorly represented and you need to make some adjustment, maybe select another area, maybe uh, put a higher uh, weight to that species so it, it would be uh, more protected than the final solution. I mean, I'm not, I'm not entering in details of how you run an analysis of systematic conservation planning, but that's, you, you get the idea. And then, of course, if you have problems with data, if you think that you need more data or the plan is not enough uh, good, then you start all over again and try to get data and build the models for, for biodiversity. This is a typical systematic conservation uh, workflow that you see in any paper or a policy brief that you, <clears throat> that you read. Um, so at this time, the most important way in which ecological niche models enters, or ecological niche models enter the systematic conservation planning protocol, is usually by providing information about species distribution, correct? So we also know that these models carry uncertainties. And the world is uncertainty, and we know that uncertainties are part of the game. So what we do using environmental niche modeling and other models, like land use models, in systematic conservation planning is usually to generate species distribution. Then we have the basic data to run an analysis. We know where a species is, could be, or could not be, based on the model. And more recently, we've been using that to also consider the uncertainties in the planning. So when we have a model of species of a distribu the distribution of a species, but we also have ways to map the uncertainties associated to this model, and we can put this in the in the planning because I, I don't know I do not want to select a place uh, for conservation knowing that I have a high uncertainty in there. So I'm not very sure if the species is there, even if the model has projected it 
to be. So this is one of the recent ways in which we've been considering, considering uncertainties in, in the planning, and it arises from environmental niche modeling. Um, so from now on, I'm going to show you some, some examples, some very little examples. The literature is full of examples on how ecological niche models have been used in conservation planning. I choose three types of examples, which is the use of ecological niche models to assess representation in protected areas. Kind of the first step uh, in the systematic conservation planning. Uh, then I'll show how we can use species distribution models to select priority areas. And finally, how ecological niche models have have been used to define priority areas for restoration, which is a common trend in the field. And for each of these uh, examples, I choose one or two papers, uh, most, mostly of my own team, and, and this just because it was easier to me to gather this information explained to you, but you can uh, search for, for Web of Science or any other uh, scientific database like Scopus, and, and you find a huge amount of papers working with that, okay? So first one is a paper that we published in 2014, uh, and we're looking at uh, the distribution of amphibians in the Brazilian Atlantic forest. We model the distribution uh, of, the, of these species uh, in the Atlantic forest using ensemble forecasting techniques, six modeling methods uh, for the present and for 2050, and at that time using to greenhouse gases emission scenarios, um, which now has been converted into those uh, representative pathways of, of greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, so you, you can see here the models. Uh, for example, this is the, the, the map of species richness in the present and expected species richness in 2050, uh, data from this uh, ensemble of different methods and expected turnover. And what you see here is that we also model the species with different um, possible uh, movement uh, capabilities. So if species could move uh, 50 kilometers over 50 years or 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers, it could be, it, it, it could uh, it could show us different results based on, on how much species could move uh, in the region. So the interesting thing here is that what we do, we, we took all the protected areas that are in the Atlantic forest, and we use those maps of species distribution for the present and for the future, and we, measure, uh, we measured the, the species richness in the current time, how many species should be uh, in a particular area based on our models. And then for the same area, we measured the number of species that could be there in the future. And we did a very simple graph, <clears throat> like this one, where you see the species richness in the present and the species richness in the future. And then we have a new model, which is this uh, blue uh, dots here, that says, well, if climate change and species dispersal and the distribution of species is not related to climate, then I would expect a random distribution of species uh, richness in the present and in the future around this uh, dashed line here of the new model. It's, it basically say, if I shuffle the places where uh, protected areas uh, currently are, I will get a random response because climate is not a driver of where species could be in the, in the present or the future. And when you look at the real data that we get, which is the other colored dots, like the, the red ones, orange ones, and green ones, is that every dot is a protected area, represents a protected area in that case. So this is the number of species in that particular, in this particular protected area in the present, and the same number in the future. And if the dots are below this dotted line here, 
it means that in the present, uh, the protected area should have more species than in the future. And this is the majority of protected areas that that's the red dots you're seeing. The red dots say that compared to the new model, we have more species today in the protected area than we will expect to have in the future. There are some, some protected areas for which I cannot tell the difference, which are the orange ones, and those green dots are protected areas that could have more species in the future than they have today. Okay. Of course, if you look at this graph on the right, if we allow species to move much less, instead of 200 kilometers in the region, but only 50 over the years, then the number of species, the number of protected areas losing species is much higher, and the number of protected areas gaining species is much lower. That means that we truly expect a negative effect of climate change on species distribution within protected areas, and we do not expect that many protected areas could um, protect the species in the future, probably because those species will move to different areas and those areas are not protected. That's why species richness in the future is usually, usually lower in the future than it is in the present. So this is an interesting example of how we can use species distribution models to assess the effectiveness of protected areas or do some kind of gap analysis, for example, thinking about climate change. Another example is the use of species distribution models or ecological niche models and the definition, the very definition of priority areas. One of the first papers that did that, it's a very interesting paper, really recommend it, reading it. It's a paper from 20, uh, 2005, published in Conservation Biology by Paul Williams and um, other, other fellows. And they used a different method to do that, a method called network flow in which they model the species distributions over the area. They're, they're using the Cape, the Western Cape region in South Africa. They model the distribution uh, of species in different time steps. And then they look backwards, seeing a place that, was, that could be good in 2050, and how the network of high quality, uh, high climatic quality areas available in the region connects to the, in, among different time steps. That's what you're seeing here in this graph on the left. So you're kind of mapping the way that species could do. And these species, for example, could be here from 2020 to 2050. But there's got to be uh, some kind of way, uh, some kind of flow within the landscape that guarantee that this cell should be protected today because it will allow species to go all this path from today to 2050. This is a very interesting paper, one of the first uh, using ecological niche modeling and systematic conservation planning. Of course, today we, we use different uh, methods. I'll give you another example from, from one of my students. And it was done for protecting mammals in, in the Brazilian Amazon under climate change. Uh, of course, this paper was published in 2018, so 13 years after uh, that paper by Paul Williams, and we have a very much uh, different and very more complex protocol to achieve that, and that's just, just how uh, the field has been developed. But we, we do have ecological niche models here for different species, and using data, different models, combining uh, these two, those, the the models of the species, and then we have a future representation of species distribution. But we also, from those models, uh, we also get the future uncertainty in species distribution, and this gives us a measure of, we have the model of the species distribution, but we also have the model of the uncertainty associated to this uh, map. And we can put this into a conservation planning framework. In that case, we used zonation. Could have been done in Mark Sand or C plan or whatever. 
We also considered protected areas, and we also considered different climate change metrics. So we're using uh, the current and future temperatures from different models of climate to identify local anomalies, climate change extreme, climate change velocity, and uncertainty associated with those kinds of, of climate change methods. And we combine all this into a framework of conservation planning in, in which we consider the distribution of the species in the present, in the future, and the uncertainty associated to, to that distribution. We also consider uh, the effects of the local and regional effects of climate change and time uh, in, in, in this place. And we also consider uh, some kind of the protected areas and the distribution of protected areas uh, and how that influences in creating corridors or creating a more compact priority in order to, to achieve cost efficiency. And then we, you can get results like this. A map of priority areas. What you're seeing here in green are protected areas. Uh, those places in dark gray are indigenous lands. And then you have different levels of protection from extremely high uh, priority areas, which is uh, the red ones, as you can see here, uh, the very high priority in orange, and the high priority in, in yellow. Uh, light gray is places in, in which the, we have priorities, but we're not showing here. And then you can measure for different groups, like this, for different mammal orders, how much of representation I can get inside protected areas for example, for carnivores, and how much that representation will increase if I may make the proper actions in extremely high priority areas, and you can see it here, or if I do that both in protected areas, extremely high priority areas, and also in very high areas, and anyway, you got the message. So we can understand how much of representation we have based on the species distribution models and based on the map of priorities per se. And that's what we call uh, reviewing and analyzing uh, the, the, the planning and see, uh, to see how much representation do, do you get from it. Um, so I'm, I'm moving to another example, which is the use of ecological niche models to define restoration actions. This is a, a very uh, common and more recent applications of systematic conservation planning is to define priority areas for restoration. That is because we have many ecosystems in which restoration is priority, not conservation. And because of all uh, the efforts we've been made, we have been made on, on establishing restoration as a goal to, to to, to preserve biodiversity with the, the Paris Agreement and stuff. So my example here is a paper that we published um, last year. And it is a paper that we were trying to find priority areas for restoration in the Atlantic Forest in Brazil with different groups using species distribution modeling, uh, but also doing an, a trade-off analysis on how much uh, we can improve the conservation of species but also uh, guarantee that we have a large carbon storage and we are, sequester we are sequestering maybe, uh, a large amount of carbon from, from the atmosphere and helping with climate change issues and also considering the costs because all this uh, actually costs a lot. So what you see here, we have the map of the Atlantic forest and we have the distribution of 785 species uh, distributed among plants, birds, and amphibians, all of them endemic to the Atlantic forest and all of them modeled with uh, mark, uh, maxient uh, in different climate change scenarios. We have also a map of carbon storage and what you're seeing here in this graph is a trade-off analysis of costs and benefits of restoration. So in this map, you can see the amount of carbon sequestered. And in this axis, you can see the extinctions avoided. And that's, that has been achieved uh, based on the models of species distribution. 
And here you have solutions, possible spatial solutions. Every dot is a spatial solution for the problem. And this solution could be uh, very bad in terms of sequestering carbon or protecting biodiversity, or they could be very good in sequestering carbon, but not necessarily protecting biodiversity, or they could be very good in protecting biodiversity and avoiding extinction, but not uh, that good in terms of sequestering carbon. And all these solutions uh, have a cost. The red, reddish uh, dots are more costly, and the, the bluish ones are more uh, less costly or cheaper. So what we're trying to do, or, or we're trying to find, is under different scenarios, like this one, a scenario that favored biodiversity representation, you get the most of biodiversity, but sometimes it is uh, costly and sequestrate uh, a given amount of carbon. Then we can use another scenario that is very cheap, but it also has fewer or much lower level biodiversity protection and carbon sequestration. And then we can develop a scenario there is a kind of a compromise scenario in which we're trying to maximize all these factors at the same time. And if you look here, this is this, this, is this scenario. I mean, th this compromise scenario is here. What you see is you have a, a given amount of carbon sequestration, which is not the best one, but is not the worst one as well. You have a, a relatively high number of extinctions avoided. It's not Again, not the best one, but definitely not the, the worst one. And this is relatively cheap. I mean, this color, this bluish color, is around here, and it's among the lowest uh, costs for implementing uh, this kind of restoration. So we're actually saying, based on ecological niche models, the cost and carbon sequestration possibilities, that this space of solution could be the best one for implementing a restoration program in the Atlantic Forest because they will achieve uh, the best possible way to conserve biodiversity, to spend our money, and to uh, alleviate climate change effects by mitigating uh, uh, greenhouse gases emissions. So I'm moving to the end of, the, of this talk and I wanted to end with this question. Are we, are we making a difference? Uh, recently, a number of papers have, have discussed the problem of residual reserves. It means that we are establishing protected areas, sometimes using uh, systematic conservation planning as a basis for it. Uh, most of the times, we don't use systematic conservation planning to establish protected areas per se. Uh, but the thing is, most of these areas are residual in their nature. It means that they're actually what is what we left unused. So we use the land to for agriculture, we use the land to build cities, we use the land to build uh, reservoirs and, and build dams and anything that we, we need. And everything that we don't use on Earth, then we establish a protected area. And this could be common thought, like this, this place is useless for economic activities. But it also holds uh, some kind of biodiversity that will protect the place. It sounds an interesting argument, but it's very flawed. And it, it is flawed because sometimes the most pressing activities, like those uh, I just mentioned, like building roads or building cities or ex expanding agriculture frontier, is what puts species in danger. So the risk is that we're vanishing species from the large part of the earth and we are protecting places where species have been left there just because we we didn't want to use that that place for any other activity and that means that threatening species will keep increasing and not diminishing and that we're not very we're not being very clever to establish protected areas because we should protect the areas, should establish protected areas in places where if we don't do that, that places will disappear. And so are the species that uh, that that live there. Uh, what we're doing is to protect areas that we don't want to use. 
we did an analysis for all protected areas in Brazil in this paper that you're seeing and our results confirm that despite the increase in the number of protected areas that we have in Brazil in all biomes here's the line for the Atlantic Forest since 1940s 1935 actually to 2010 the number has increased exponentially in the Atlantic Forest in the Cerrado even in the Amazon but then when you look at this graph on the right you have a, a bias in protected areas location what you're seeing is here's the number of protected areas it is the height of this bar you have an axis I'm calling slope bias it means that we're placing protected areas in areas that are mountainous and has a steep slope areas in which we cannot do agriculture or at least mechanized agriculture we're protecting mountains in Brazil and here you have the land use intensity bias and you see that most of those protected areas are in places with low intensity mostly because those places are mountains and we don't we're not able to use that or we do not want to use that places because uh, uh, other places are, are, are much uh, much better for doing agriculture for example so what this bias make is that in Brazil we have at least 50 percent of our different types of ecosystems are completely unprotected because they're not mountainous ecosystems all the ecosystems that are related to mountains are much better protected because of this bias in protected area in location but location in Brazil this happens in Brazil this happens in the United States in Australia South Africa Japan and Europe all those places have seen bias in protected areas and we, we're not I, mean, I do not think that we're doing a good job in the way we plan for species protection in those places and all over the world there's a very good paper from, from my friend Bob Presser that discusses this. It was published in 2017 in Biological Conservation. I really recommend you, you to read in it because there you find an author saying that before making any plan, before setting any strategy for conserving biodiversity, you need to look at evidence informed uh, data and you need to think about what is the real difference that I'm going to do. If I actually implement some kind of action for protecting the species, then this action would be paramount for species protection. In other words, I mean, if I do not uh, make this action in the next close future, like two to five years, species will vanish, species will go extinct, ecosystem types will disappear. This got to be our guide, like we need to do actions that will have the most impact in short time. Because if we, if we keep thinking about large uh, time scales, then it will be very difficult to, to protect biodiversity that is threatened by uh, current activities. So my take home messages are over the last 40 years, systematic conservation planning has become the most important optimization tool to support spatial conservation decision. Uh, it has been used in different types of the planet, different countries, uh, from academia to NGOs and national governments. Ecological niche models have been used in a variety of ways in systematic conservation planning, especially for providing species distribution data, which are the, the primary data that we need to run a systematic conservation planning analysis and for including uncertainties in the planning process. And that now, and this is a topic for a totally different class, that systematic conservation planning faces a challenge and needs to adjust to guarantee that we, we use uh, in a way that we will make a difference in a changing world, that we will protect the species that need to be protected and protect the places that will otherwise disappear if we don't take any action. So this is it, a very uh, introductory, in, introductive panorama, maybe, uh, of the topic. I hope you have liked it, and 
let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.